On a warm summer night in 1971, a somewhat intoxicated, penniless British traveller lay on his back in a field near Innsbruck, Austria, contemplating the infinite vastness of the universe above him. Cushioning his head, or at least somewhere in the immediate vicinity, was a tattered copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to Europe. His fertile mind spewed forth a constant stream of ideas, as it always seemed to do, and started to connect them in the most bizarre lateral ways, and he thought, wait, we're getting a bit of ahead of ourselves here, aren't we? Let's go back a bit. As a young man, Douglas enjoyed playing French cricket with his sister. There is no doubt had he continued... Hmm, a uh, bit too far, I'm afraid. Much better. The first inkling as to what kind of writer Douglas Adams would become appeared at a very early age while he was attending grammar school. Douglas came into my form in 1961, when he was nine years old. Um, and what I remember of him is, first of all, of course, he was tall. I was always fantastically tall. Uh, this meant, uh, when I was a kid, uh, if we'd go on a school expedition somewhere, the teacher would always say, well, you know, at four o'clock, well, whereas normally he would say, you know, at four o'clock, you know, meet under the clock tower or whatever. They'd say, at four o'clock, meet under Adams. Uh... <laughs> Other than that, I remember nothing of him except that one day in March, in 1962, he wrote a story. Um, I gave him 10 out of 10. I never did it again. I was at the school, taught at the school for over 30 years. So I was, I was always kind of in a slightly different sort of universe than everybody else. Douglas must have felt encouraged, for at the age of 11, he submitted two pieces to the Eagle. They were published, and he was paid the enormous sum of 10 shillings each for them. While still in school, he began showing signs of what was to become his lifelong struggle to meet deadlines. In the Brentwood Literary Magazine June edition, he prefaces his article by writing, I confess and worthily lament that laziness and lethargy on my part deprived these columns of an account of the doings of that worthy body, the Chapel Choir, in the January edition of the Brentwoodian. To all the choir's avid followers, I present my humble apologies. After Brentwood, Douglas had been accepted into Cambridge, but he decided to see a bit of the continent first. Which brings us back to this field in Innsbruck. Uh, where were we? Infinite Universe, Hitchhiker's Guide, Fertile Mind, Connected in Bizarre Way. That's it. And an idea occurred to him. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he thought, somebody really ought to write that. Really, the only significant bit he missed was that the somebody who should create this groundbreaking work that changed science fiction forever would be him. A little known fact about Douglas Adams is that his first true ambition in life was to be a certain tall British comedian. Well, but Douglas, Douglas always really wanted to perform because his, I mean, his, his uh, idol was John Cleese and he really felt that he almost wanted to be John Cleese, I think, at times. If you attend Cambridge and you want to be John Cleese, you join Footlights. But first, you must write a sketch and audition. I'd sat there all morning listening to sketches. Oh, I don't know, existentialism, Bertrand Russell. I don't know, witty, sophisticated sketches that didn't make me laugh at all. And finally, Douglas came on with two friends, tall, lanky, proceeded to um, swallow what appeared to swallow about a pint of water. And uh, <laughs> while one friend cranked his arm, he spat the contents into the face of the other. For some reason or another, this struck me as extremely funny. I think possibly because it was such a contrast to everything I've seen beforehand. I said he must become a member immediately. But Douglas's style never really worked in Footlights, which tended to be more of a variety show. He started searching for other venues. We met Douglas, I suppose, in 1971, when our first year at Cambridge. We, Will and I met, and then Will and I did a sketch for the next smoker, and by yeah, the I, end of the second term, the three of us are working yeah, together. I, I had the that. writing trio had their own method of collaborating. 
Douglas was suddenly appear in, in my room and say, I've got this amazing idea, look, really funny. And he'd sort of be building it up and building it up, and five lines later it was over. Mm. And we'd say, well, it's not going to last three or four minutes, is it? We'd, we should, we'd have to get to work on this. The best and craziest ideas were Douglas's, I think, oh, yeah, probably, definitely. weren't they? You know, the, the, the cat shaving. And also the worst and craziest ideas, yes, actually. It's just the craziest they, ideas. They, they were the ones it appears cat shaving was a favourite activity at Cambridge, even inspiring Adams Smith Adams to explore its deeper meaning in the lyrics of this catchy little tune. Well, babe, it often seems I've always known you in my dreams. You came to me beneath the moon that starry night in early June. Well, babe, I think I love you. You make my heart go pitter-pat, feeling so romantic. I think I'll go and shave the cat. As Adams Smith Adams' ideas became more focused and their reputation grew, they were joined by two fellow classmates for a review in a London theatre. Mary was already called Mary Adams as a, as, a, as, a, as a stage name, but Johnny Lloyd became Johnny Smith just for that particular review, so at least we could be Adams Smith Adams Smith Adams once. Douglas on stage was irrepressible. He always had this great sense of glee, and he was quite difficult to act with at that sense, because you always felt that he was about to burst out laughing himself, so you had this sort of manic personality next to you. While performing to captive audiences in a university setting was quite enjoyable, it wasn't the real world. The days at Cambridge were coming to an end. When we left uh, university, we, we, we were going to become famous scriptwriters. Yes. Or the three of us. Yes. Uh, and we, we, we were not famous for a little while, mm. uh, and then decided not to do, you know, went, went our, our different ways. Douglas decided to become a, a, a multi-millionaire celebrity and uh, we, didn't. We, we took the alternative mm. path mm. of comparative obscurity. I know you. Yeah, mm. yes. Although it sounds easy, it wasn't. Douglas was struggling as he searched for a niche to tell his stories. As times got harder, he started to question his ability to make his living as a writer. I can't breathe anymore. I'm starved, mostly. Um, uh, yes, between, between college and writing Hitchhiker, uh, I mean, I wanted to be a writer, and I was doing bits and pieces here and there, you know, a little bit of radio, a little bit of television, um, scarcely managing to, to pay the bills, um, and floundering around trying to find the right way forward. I wasn't someone to whom it came naturally to write to order. I kind of needed my own the chance to go and explore my own universe. And it was in the end one particular producer who kind of um, took up my case and decided that, you know, maybe I had something. It was clear that he had a very original mind and I wanted to get Douglas writing stuff for radio and he was very keen to write for radio. I was always kind of interested in science fiction and I was also interested in the way that comedy and science fiction would fit together. There just seemed to be to me to be a natural. But he had a very unusual mind uh, and we had some fairly traditional shows going out. And everybody told me at the time of course it couldn't be done because, and here's why not, if it could be done it would have been done already. Um, and, um, but I came up at one point with a whole series of different ideas, different single story ideas, each of which ended with the world being destroyed for a different reason. And I remember it very distinctly that he came and we had a meeting in my office uh, before going out for a nice Japanese lunch, I remember. And Douglas came in and he got three ideas. And one of them was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And neither of us can ever remember what the other two were. Now he had an idea and a producer to champion it. But as the process of getting it into the BBC pipeline dragged on, Douglas was sinking into a black mood. He needed to work. When offered the chance to return to Cambridge and direct the Footlight Smoker, he jumped at it. Will and I travelled up to Oxford, to work at the Oxford Playhouse, to see the show. And he said, right, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off, I'm fed up with it all. And I actually, I've not had anything bought, I've not really enjoyed this process of directing that, that much, really. It's all good. I'm actually thinking of giving up altogether. I've, I've been offered a job. I think he said it was in import export, but it was definitely in Tokyo, uh, where he would have been outstanding yeah. at six foot five. And he said, "You know, this is it. I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm, I, now's the moment. I'm just going I'm to. I'm, I'm, I've got the contract. I'm going to sign it. I'm going to send it back. And I'm going to live out in Tokyo and work out." 
that very week, um, the BBC sent him a note saying that Hitchhiker would be made into a pilot. He put the career on, uh, on hold. Douglas was, needless to say, delighted and went off to write it. And the amazing thing about it is, and this puts me in a minority of one, he delivered it on time because he knew that the programme could not be made until we got the script. So he actually delivered the pilot script on time. We recorded the pilot one day in um, 1978, I think it was, 1977 maybe. And um, then once we'd made it, and it was relatively simple, that one. I mean, it was just the end of the world. It hadn't got all the major sound effects and things that came later, though the end of the world took a bit of doing. Any euphoria was short-lived. The next phase of the approval process dragged on into summer. While the upper echelons of the BBC went on holiday, Douglas had nothing to show for his years in the real world, but a large overdraft and no obvious way to pay it off. Slightly desperately, he sent his pilot script to the long-running BBC science fiction series, Doctor Who. I was absolutely penniless, you know, sort of sleeping on friends' couches and so on. But it was just extraordinarily exciting. Um, uh, and, and the more one looks back on it, the more exciting you realise it was, actually, at the time. While he may not have been paid very much for script editing the show, the experience would help him refine his already unique writing style. I remember when I was a script editor at the BBC, and people would send all sorts of story ideas, and, and people would write incredibly long screeds. You would never have time to read, you'd never understand them, and you'd usually need a magnifying glass because they typed it so closely. So I used to write back saying, I haven't got time to read your story idea. If you want to make it irresistibly concise to me, then, then I'll be able to read and, 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 and respond. Irresistibly concise. Now, that's good from the point of view of the reader, but it's also very good from the point of view of the writer. And we'll learn more about that later on, when we learn just how Douglas wrote books and dealt with deadlines. But for now, back to the radio show. And then, once we'd edited the script uh, and edited the recording, I, I went back to my heads of department and played them this half-hour tape, you see. And they were all kind of um, ex-fighter pilots from the Second World War. Uh, and they sat around in total silence for half an hour. And at the end, my boss said to me, Simon, is it funny? And I said, it is. And he said, oh, well, that, that's good enough for me. As often happens for artists, the floodgates opened. Douglas found himself writing and script editing Doctor Who while also trying to write the next five episodes of the radio series. Learn to relish the problems, because problems are the things that actually start you thinking creatively. Make the most of your limitations, because they're the things that work in your favor. Work with the grain of whatever your problem is. Um, you know, if, you're, if you were, uh, when, when Michelangelo was doing his David, um, and he'd got the biggest bit of uh, marble, a most beautiful piece of marble. And uh, you, know, you know how the David looked? Uh, he's, sort of, um, he's sort of standing there, and it's kind of like that. And the reason he's like that, and it's, it's a very, very dramatic and distinctive pose, and not at all camp, of course, um, is that uh, originally it was going to be there, but there was a crack in the marble. So he suddenly had to rethink and, and, and bring it back like that, and he created in, in that you know, the most distinctive uh, statue in the world. And, 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 and he might have thought at one point, damn, I couldn't do what I first set out to. But he, he modified it to the resources he had, and suddenly it turned, turned into something completely timeless and extraordinary. Simon Brett had gone off to BBC television, and Douglas was assigned a new, very enthusiastic, if somewhat inexperienced, producer. I remember going out with Douglas the night before we did the first recording and finally having to come clean to him and saying, uh, I'm really sorry, Douglas, but I have to tell you, I have no idea what I'm doing with this show. And Douglas said, uh, that's all right, neither have I. Geoffrey Perkins' enthusiasm was tested when Douglas's writing style, or rather his not writing style, collided with the show's production schedule. The very last show we ever did, um, Douglas had talked about the outline of how it was going to go, but 
but I only had half the script when we started the recording. And I'd booked Jonathan Price. I booked him on the grounds that uh, there was going to be this character who was the ruler of the universe. And I had to say, I'm really sorry, but um, the ruler of the universe hasn't been written yet. Do you mind playing this character called Zani Whoop? And he said, um, OK, who's Zani Whoop? And I said, I've no idea. I'm just reading it for the first time. So he did Zani Whoop, and there was still no sign of the, uh, the ruler of the universe. So he did a talking door for a bit. And then he said, I'm really sorry, but I'm in the theatre and I've really got to go. Although proud of the finished product, Douglas wanted some feedback before it was released to the general public. He got hold of Terry Jones and Michael Palin and got them to come in and listen to, um, to a couple of episodes. So we sat in this uh, office while this very anxious Douglas and his anxious producer <laughs> sat around playing the, uh, all the episodes of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and watching our reactions. <laughs> Mike and I were sitting there sort of listening to this for the first time this is before it went out. And I think we thought it was very funny, um, but I, I don't think we had any idea about how funny it was and how amazingly successful it was going to be. As the show started to air on Radio 4, reviews and listener numbers began trickling in. You always remember the bad reviews. I think one of the shows actually got an audience figure of apparently 0.0. I can remember the show being called by somebody noisy and confused and somebody else saying um, this show wasn't at all educational and should be taken off and replaced by something like a programme on national anthems of the world. To a young girl, this was just my brother, in his bedroom, playing with the typewriter, you know, and I was just coming home from school and saying, hi, can I have a go? You know, and banging out the words, and he throws some funny lines at me and I'd giggle, and not knowing that then that was going in. Mum would be downstairs saying, who's stolen the bloody pens? There are no pens. There were loads of pens on the top of the fridge. You know, and the next thing, it's, the, it's turned into a planet where all the biros get sent. So there wasn't there wasn't a conscious understanding of there's this great work being you know created here i think the first time i had an inkling that it might be really successful was when i got a letter which was simply addressed to megadodo publications megadodo house ursa minor and somebody from the post office had written try bbc over it and i thought well if people in the post office know about this program we might be onto something the radio series soon developed a devoted following among the Radio 4 listening audience. And in that audience was one man who saw the potential for something even more unlikely. I was the commissioning editor of Pan Books in 1978, and I heard Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on the radio and was immediately won over by it. So I beat a path to his agent's door. His then agent was someone called Jill Foster. And we haggled, and I bought the rights. And then I met Douglas before we finally did the deal in a pub near the London Palladium um, with John Lloyd, where we had a very good rapport and consumed many pints of beer. Pitching the idea to his editors and the sales force at Pan proved a bit more difficult. You have to basically go to the editorial meeting and say, guys, have I got a book for you? This is amazing. It's got X, Y, and Z virtues. This is how we'll uh, put it over. It can be packaged just like this. And I think I was the only person there who had actually heard the radio program. And there was a certain amount of sort of cynical disbelief. But I had bought the book by then anyway, which was naughty of me, because I was quite junior. I didn't really have the power to um, spend the company's money without getting the, uh, the uh, say-so of the powers that be. And there was a certain amount of, oh, Christ, Nick, what have you done? <laughs> So Douglas was going to be an author, and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was going to be a book. There was only one small detail that needed to be tended to before the book could be published. It had to be written. Luckily, he had a plan. When Douglas was asked by Pam to write a book, he decided that what he needed was some time to himself. And uh, this was the 1970s. Where did we all go on holidays in the 1970s? We went to Greek islands. So he and John Lloyd booked a villa on the west coast of Corfu. Douglas said, Mary, you know, we're going on holiday. Me, Johnny, Corfu could be good. Why don't you come too? So I agreed to go along to Corfu. It appears that for Douglas, a house full of people was as alone as he preferred to be when it came to writing a book. 
but writing near the beach did produce one fairly good idea. And every day we would be about to go down to the beach and suddenly there'd be a big hold up because Douglas couldn't find his towel. Douglas didn't know where his towel was. So he'd search the little villa, you know, in, is it in the bed, is it under the bed, is it in the bathroom, is it hanging on the line at the back? Could never ever find the damn thing. And after a while this became symptomatic of my general sort of chaos in life. And, and this phrase emerged, and I don't even know if I was the one who was responsible for it, which was that, uh, you know, somebody who was a together kind of person will be somebody who really knew where their towel was. Douglas also is a writer who needs to test his material against anyone he can find. Every mm, half an hour, hour, certainly every half day, you'd hear, Mary, can you just hear the last few pages? Well, it's very, very funny, but of course, once you'd heard it about 15 times, it wasn't quite so funny. Um, Douglas in compositional mode was rather lugubrious because he, he wrote with a large grey felt hat on and he used to play the guitar, that's how he thought, and he played the left-handed guitar and he would just strum, da-dum, 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 and you'd have the wind going outside and you'd be there wrapped in your blanket, da-dum, da-dum, Douglas in his grey hat. It was a terrible holiday, absolutely ghastly. As the pleasant interlude drew to an end, the book was nowhere near completion. Douglas returned to London to the palatial flat that he was sharing with John Cantor and continued working on the manuscript. He was intense. He, he, the, the summer that he wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the one I remember because he lived in the attic room of this little flat. And being obsessive, he decided that, do you remember that um, Kate Bush song, Wuthering Heights? He decided that Wuthering Heights was going to be his song of the summer. So the entire time he wrote that novel, he played that record maybe a thousand times, two thousand times. So it's in, imprinted on my memory whether I want it or not. Now, there are an enormous number of stories concerning Douglas's superhuman ability to miss deadlines. We'll hear some of them later. All of his editors had their own unique way of dealing with this, with varying amounts of success, although few were as effective as his first editors. I was the smart ass that bought the book and then did a runner before I coped with the appalling trauma of Douglas's deadlines. But they were famous in the industry. I mean, stories about Douglas's deadlines were, were legion. And he used to say, I love deadlines, I love to see them whizzing by. But I fortunately never experienced them myself. The deadline for delivering the book had come and gone. Finally, under ultimatum from his editor, Douglas finished the manuscript in haste and handed it in. His life would never be the same. Nobody had any idea whether the book was going to work or not, but I'd been asked to go along and do a, um, a signing session at a little science fiction store, Forbidden Planet in Denmark Street. On, on, on the Saturday. So I went along, got in a taxi, went along, couldn't get there, because there were, um, there, there seemed to be something happening in the centre of London uh, that was causing sort of crowds and uh, traffic jams. The big event that was taking place was his book signing, and the reason why the streets were all cordoned off was because there were so many fans, thousands of people were waiting to see him. He was, he was coming to dinner here, actually. Uh, we were having dinner around this table, and, um, there were quite a few other guests, I think, and, uh, and Douglas was late, and we all looked at our watches waiting for Douglas to arrive. And uh, eventually he, he arrived about an hour and a half late, and he said, I'm terribly sorry, I, I've just, it was, they, they were, it was the uh, book signing for the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It was the first uh, uh, book signing, and he, he'd gone along, and he said, he said, I've just signed a thousand books. I remember the moment that changed his life being when he went to go out and buy some Coca-Cola and he came back with 144 cans of Coca-Cola because he could, because he realised that his life had changed and there was no point in buying one. His life had changed and the effects of it would touch everyone around him. I remember my younger brother asking Douglas to write his name down on a, lot, on a sheet of paper a lot of times and then taking them back to school and selling them. <laughs> um, I actually have a... Um, a photograph of him and on the back my mum has written this is my son signed Janet Thrift and I had to take that into school to show my English teacher because he thought I was making it up and was just sort of bragging I suppose. I remember he got <laughs> he got his first Porsche um, 
when was that? It must have been, oh, early 80s, because we were driving away. I lived near Hyde Park Corner at that stage, and we, I know we drove away from that flat. And here we were batting down Park Lane and going a bit too fast, and we actually crashed into Hyde Park Corner <laughs> in this Porsche. But that was, you know, that was Douglas, exuberant, over-enthusiastic, you know, a bit sort of, oh, God, this is all so much, I can't quite keep control of it. You know, this, was, this was, I think, how Douglas related to that very early success. Now, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the type of idea most writers dream of. Besides the radio show and the book, it spun off a television show, several versions for the stage, the second radio series, a couple of record albums, a towel, an abridged and unabridged talking book, two almost hit singles by a paranoid android and a best-selling computer game, which we'll learn more about later on. Each of these creations has its own fascinating history, including tales of deadlines missed, or at least infinitely extended, not to mention Douglas's delight in... The whooshing noise they made as they went by, deadlines. Many of these stories are well documented, and to cover them all could be a film in and of itself. But there was more to Douglas Adams than missed deadlines and best-selling books. His enchantment with the world and the way it worked permeated every aspect of his life. Douglas wasn't just the author that I'd, I'd, I'd read about, but Douglas was much more than that. I mean, there was a lot more about him that people didn't really get to know unless you really met Douglas and, and you spent some time with Douglas. And he was he's the only person I had met who, whilst being a dedicated um, if you like, artist in terms mm -hmm. of the subjects he studied at university, did not feel that meant he was not allowed to be interested in science. Douglas was immensely enthusiastic about science and he knew a great deal about science, not just one science, as I know about biology or a physicist knows about physics, he knew a lot about lots of different sciences, not in a professional way, of course, and he did sort of have an ambition to go back to university, but it, it would have been silly, I think. And so he set off on a journey to explore his world and everything in it, and his explanations of what he found were like no one else's. Douglas's books are filled with scientific imagination and scientific wit. He was funny because he saw the world through witty eyes, and it was mostly wit informed by science. He was intrigued by the bizarreness of the world as science shows it. So the idea that here we are living, as he put it, uh, in, uh, in the depths of a gravity, gravity well, well, on the surface of a gas-covered planet, which is simultaneously spinning around its own axis and orbiting a giant fireball 92 million miles away. And the fact that we take this as normal... Was to him a funny idea. It was, it was comic because it was sort of ludicrous, but it was wonderful at the same time. From his love of science flowed an insatiable curiosity. Uh, certainly uh, computer science is something else I would very, very have happily have gone into. I mean, I still remember, you know, when I was about, oh, you know, 15 or something, and there were these people who would often stay behind and do an extra class after school. And I'd occasionally sort of look into the window and see them appearing to be sticking knitting needles through, in play, through playing cards. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what on earth it was about. <laughs> what were they doing? And the answer was they were training to be billionaires. <laughs> um, <laughs> Douglas's first encounter with a personal computer was not the immediate case of reciprocal love one might have imagined. I remember the first computer I ever saw. It was a Commodore PET. And it was standing in a little sort of store in London. And I went and had a look at it and thought, I cannot imagine anything that I, as a writer, could possibly need a computer for. What could I possibly think of doing with a computer? I had no idea what I could do, but I did at the same time feel the first tiniest inklings of um, something that uh, went on to give a whole new meaning to the phrase disposable income. But once he had tested the waters, he dove in headlong. His first computer was a standalone word processor from ICL, followed by something called an apricot, and then one of the infamous deck rainbows. And then, finally, the Macintosh came out. And the Mac uh, then I knew I'd met my soulmate. This was, this, this was a computer I could do business with, you know. <laughs> This is a computer I could work on. Now, let's examine what he meant by work. Douglas did often have problems with the technology. They were usually entirely self-inflicted because of his insatiable curiosity. Um, he once said to me, rather ruefully, 
that if Dickens had had a word processor, he'd have written two novels. You know, he used to describe writing as being, you know, staring at a blank sheet of paper until his forehead bled. And so he'd do all sorts of things to avoid actually having to do any work. He'd have multiple baths. And then the computer came along and he found out that he could prolong the process infinitely by rebuilding his computer or just installing a new version of the operating system or this rather fun new piece of software which was almost guaranteed to trash his machine. That's when the f then, he'd, then, he'd, then he'd give me or whoever was working with him a call and, and sort of say, it doesn't work anymore, I can't possibly do any writing now. How do we recognise something that's still technology? A good clue is if, if it comes with a manual. A chair, for instance, doesn't come with a manual. Unless it's one of those office chairs with levers and locks and tension springs all over it. Like most things designed to enhance your productivity, playing with it all day is much more fun than actually working. Douglas was finding uses for his computer, one of which was playing a game called Zork. And in 1983, he entered into a collaboration with the company that had created it. Now, many years ago, I wrote a computer game based on The Hitchhiker's Guide oh, to the Galaxy. Okay. Hang, hang on just a moment here. Something I feel I ought to point out so you don't think we missed it or just plain forgot. Between the first book and the computer game, Douglas wrote two more Hitchhiker's books and, with John Lloyd, a book of definitions of words that didn't exist but should have. And we will talk about how Douglas wrote those books sooner or later. Carry on. As far as I know, was the first piece of software that deliberately lied to you. But it's obviously started a bit of a trend. <laughs> One of the things that AT&T's voice response system continually tells you is that it is there to serve you better. I may not have invented artificial intelligence, but maybe I can claim to be the father of artificial mendacity. <laughs> Douglas and Steve Moretzky of Infocom had been working on the game for several months with the goal of having it on the shelves for the holidays when Steve got word to pack his bags. Now at this time, um, Douglas was also working on the fourth Hitchhiker's book and um, he was also way behind on that. I was there for about three or four days and we finished up the design of the game and then I came back to Massachusetts and basically had like a week and a half to get all that material into the game and get it ready for testing in order to meet the schedule. Douglas finished the new book and as the game neared the testing phase he traveled to America to help Steve tweak the final product. It was an adventure game which kind of required people to think, you know, to solve puzzles and, and that's always a very difficult balance working on that kind of a game to, um, to balance it so that it's hard enough to be a challenge. You know, otherwise a player can just waltz through the game. Um, during that last week in September of 84 when Douglas had come over to, to finish up and he was just leaving, heading to the airport and I was about to go into a meeting with the testers where I knew they were gonna be bashing on me to make the game easier. I said, you know, what should I tell them? And he said, tell them to fuck off. So I, um, I think that that, you know, kind of summed up his, you know, really strong conviction for, you know, for his vision of the game. As Douglas began to explore and better understand technology, he formulated what we can comfortably call Adams' three rules of innovation. Rule one, anything that's in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary and just a natural part of the way the world works. Rule two, Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. Rule three, anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. He loved technology, he loved all sorts of gadgets. And Douglas could have multiple gadgets working together. They were like, well, Douglas, why would you want your phone to communicate with this to do this? And he would always have a rationale or a reason for it. And then like, yeah, okay, that would make sense. He was also fanatically uh, devoted to the cause of computers and, uh, and actually to their simplification. I think he resented, I know I do, the fact that computers, even to this day, are as complicated as they are. I remember him saying 15 years ago, don't worry, he said, in 15 years' time, it'll be very easy. All you'll have to do is press a button and it will do what you ask it. Nah, we all make mistakes, and it's especially easy to make the blindingly obvious ones. And none of us 
can predict the future. Even the computer industry, which is more concerned about the future than most industries on the planet, failed to predict certain key things. Like, for instance, the fact that the century was going to end. <laughs> but I guess we can say that our future is, for a while, going to be dominated by technology. And technology, as Danny Hillis pointed out, is our word for stuff that doesn't work yet. Douglas had a love-hate relationship with another piece of technology that doesn't quite work yet, the mobile phone. What Douglas would do when I shared a flat with him was he would ring somebody up and he would talk to them normally, he wouldn't mention the mobile phone, and then he would walk into the lavatory and he would start urinating. Now, he was a very big man and the person at the other end of the line would say, what's that, Douglas? And he would say, oh, sorry, I I'm just on a mobile phone and I needed a pee. I think this is one of my favourite stories about Douglas, that uh, we, um, we went as, as two families to Fiji on holiday. And one of the trips that we made in, in, uh, while we were there was to the island where Castaway, the, the movie Castaway, was, uh, was filmed. It's an island called Monoriki. And it's a completely deserted island uh, in the middle of the Pacific, uh, very much as it looks on, on, uh, on the movie, except that uh, there's a few other islands around which they've digitally pasted out, which appeal to him as well. But um, the thing that stunned and amazed Douglas was that here on this island, in the middle of the Pacific, uh, with not a human inhabitant, he had perfect cell phone reception. Why was the perfect cell phone reception? Apparently, it was in Tom Hanks's contract that there had to be. Now what we want to do is try and persuade Tom Hanks to do a road movie on the 101. He was so chuffed at, uh, at, at uh, having this perfect reception. He had to find somebody. Unfortunately, uh, he chose his secretary, Sophie. He phoned her in the middle of the night in London to tell her that he was standing on this island in the middle of the Pacific with perfect cell phone reception. Douglas was permanently disappointed with technology and gadgets. You have to remember he was an optimist. Therefore, he lived in an idealized world. And anything that didn't deliver on that, which is by definition nearly everything, was a disappointment to him. But he was always an optimist, so he'd always go out and buy the next generation in the hope that it would get that little bit better. This love of gadgets is obvious in his books, and although the actual guide had some physical similarities to the PDA and some technological similarities to the internet, Douglas maintained that it was purely coincidental. I didn't foresee the internet. Um, I mean, I kind of said something that sounds a little bit like what the internet became. But I mean, I was not, I mean, I, I'm not a predictive science fiction writer. I mean, I was actually, what I was solving there was a narrative problem for myself. Douglas may not have invented the internet, but once it existed, he had some very definite opinions on what role it could play in our lives. And now that we're networking all our computers together, we've come up with yet another insight, the World Wide Web. The computer isn't just a typewriter or a television. Even more exciting than that, it's a brochure. I think he felt very much that the, 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 the internet hadn't yet really begun to achieve its full potential. And I think what he was fascinated in was the potential for emergent intelligence. In 1994, as the tech rally roared, Douglas and several colleagues created the Digital Village. So I think the idea of, of the Digital Village was really to, to, to try and provide a place where we could apply new technology to, to creative ideas. Collaborating with Douglas on Starship Titanic was actually a great joy because he himself was happier in his own words, working, working on that than he had been since he did the original radio series. He would spend half a meeting talking about the creative ideas for the game and the other half talking about the computers that are actually being used to make it happen. Douglas recruited one of his oldest friends to play a pivotal role. Terry's a great old friend. Uh, I, I, I love working with Terry. Uh, it's funny, I mean, for years and years and years, we used to regularly get together to... Um, and have dinner and talk about something we might do together. And after a while, we just enjoyed the dinners, you know. And I said to him, are you sure you want me to do a voice of a parrot? I, I, he said, yes, of course, of course. I said, I don't know whether I can do a good parrot. He said, Terry, you've, that's all you've ever played all your life is parrots. And I certainly thought he was quite right, you know, sort of spam, spam, spam. You know, he's not the Messiah, he's just a naughty boy. I'd always been playing parrots, so he took Douglas to <laughs> recognise this. The recording session was an adventure in itself. Anyway, I went along and did the parrot for him, and um, 
uh, which involved being totally nude in a, in a booth, actually, because I got so wet. It's very exhausting being a parrot, but I got so sweaty in this little booth. I just had to take all my clothes off, because otherwise, like, <laughs> I was going out in the evening, all my clothes would got soaked through, so it looked a bit odd. And, of course, like any good uh, game company, we completely missed our deadline on it. Um, and we had all the usual sort of fraughtness that, that lies around that, but we got it out in the end. Of course, in 99, we won the Cody Award for Best Adventure Game with it, so that made him very pleased in the end. Like a lot of people, I've just lost my own brilliant dot-com company. Just like everybody else's brilliant dot-com companies, it was based on the wonderful mathematical notion that if you multiply zero by a sufficiently large number, it'll suddenly turn into something. Another of Douglas's great passions was for music, especially playing the guitar. Um, well, I, I think I'd quite like to be a rock star, and I think I'm nearly old enough now. Uh... I remember we were sitting at his house having dinner one night, and um, he started to enthuse about, about Gary Brooker. And I was so shocked because I know Gary. And um, I just sat quietly and listened to what he was saying. And he was you know, putting Gary in the same bracket as Bach and, you know, all these greats. And, and I just happened to say to him, well, you know, I know him. Would you like to meet him? Well, the first time that I went round to his house um, and, and met him, he was a, a marvellous host. And I think he had so much to sort of ask me and talk about that although we got there at about half past seven, we had dinner at 10.30. And there was a lot of empty champagne bottles around. <laughs> and when we'd had dinner afterwards, he said, oh, do you think you could play me something on the piano? What would you like? He says, a rum tail is one of my favorites. Um, so I sat down and of course he picked one of the most complicated uh, songs that there that there is, to, especially to play on the piano, and I fumbled through and uh, got got stopped. You know, after about one minute, sort of totally lost it. And he said, "No, it goes like this," <clears throat> and he sat down and played it for me, which was, of course, embarrassing. And I've never got caught out on that one since. He'd followed them round and seen them play loads of times. And when they, you know, he and Gary finally got to know each other, he'd be talking to Gary about things and reminding Gary of stuff. And Gary said to me, you know, he knows more about the archiving of this band than, than me and anybody I know. In 1997, Proguan, you know, had been going 30 years. We hadn't played anywhere that year. And it was suggested that we have a bit of a concert stroke party. And we did it in the Harley Quinn Theatre in Redhill. There was a recitation part in it, which Keith had done on the record, but he wasn't able to get over for that. Um, and so again, I sort of bent Douglas's ear and said, would you mind, you know, taking over, doing the bit? I think he was, he was thrilled at the idea. I feel that he'd rather have been playing the guitar, I expect, but he had to settle for saying the words. Well, close by that which some despise, which some call fake, others lies. Somewhat small for one so tall, a doubt of Thomas Hoover has written plain for all to see. Yeah, good taste because his favourite guitar, of course, was was the Martin Martin acoustic, of which he had several. Um, he was a left-handed guitar player, so the ones he had were pretty special, pretty rare. He had tons and tons of guitars. Douglas had 23 guitars. You know that, don't you? All left-handed. Except for one. He kept one right-handed guitar one right for Dave Gilmore for Dave to come over and play. Or, you know, guitarists to come and play so that they could play along together. Yeah. And Dave kept a left-handed guitar. At his house. At his house for Douglas. Uh, and I did uh, something I'm always very proud of telling people. Um, one of the sort of highlights of my life. At Earl's Court in London, I got up and st I stood up and played guitar with Pink Floyd. <laughs> On stage with Pink Floyd. So. It was a, it was a good moment. It was, you can see why they do it. You really, really can. It isn't just the sex and the drugs. It is actually the rock and roll. <laughs> do I play guitar? Yes, I do. Yes. I think they probably would not have asked me if I. It was my 42nd birthday present from David Gilmore. So.
<laughs> Douglas combined his love of music with his wide circle of friends, added his fondness for parties, and came up with a brilliant idea. I was just trying to think how they started yeah. off. Because when we'd go around there, if Robbie was there, they'd pick up a couple of guitars, and I'd strum a guitar, or if I, if I took the accordion around, we'd have a, like a jam session or something like that. And maybe the idea bore fruit from that. He only seemed to have a very small circle of, um, of musician friends that he seemed to stick with. And now and again, he would suggest that we kind of got together, go around to his house, and have a play. He had a nice little grand piano there, and we'd all squash into the front of his salon. And of course, he would invite about 200 other people. There'd be like sardines in there. I mean, the audience, in fact, was more famous than the band. Yeah. It was ridiculous, <laughs> you know. You would look out, and there would be. Um, Paul Allen was there, and George Martin, Salman Rushdie. Ah. Crammed right in. You know, right up as far as they can get to the front of the stage, because there's no more room so to get them far. in, looking up your nose as you play. I mean, it's a great way to see music. Oh, it's fantastic. Right in your face. And, you know, when you get Robbie playing guitar at you like that, and Gary singing, and Margot singing, and, David Gilmore and Dave playing too. guitar. It's just a fantastic Magic. way to see some music that you're never going to see any other way. And I must say that um, I, uh, there are two times when I saw Douglas ecstatically happy. One was after Polly was born, and the other was at those gigs. I mean, he just was ecstatic. While Douglas had few qualms about having the Vogons demolish the earth in Hitchhikers, in real life he had a passion for the planet and its many life forms. I actually think it was part and parcel of the same thing. Douglas was fed up with the world as it was, but he understood that there were wonderful, beautiful things about the world, like the mountain gorillas and the rhinoceroses and the animal, the wildlife. And he wanted to, he wanted to save those things that he cherished most in the world, but he, he suffered fools badly. Which is rather like, if you imagine a puddle waking up one morning. I know this doesn't often happen, but I'm, <laughs> tonight, I'm allowed to have puddles waking up. And a puddle wakes up one morning and thinks, oh, this is an interesting world I find myself in. It's an interesting hole I seem to be inhabiting. Hmm, it fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, in fact, it fits me staggeringly neatly. <laughs> it must have been made to have me in it. <laughs> and, uh, and this is such a powerful idea that as the sun rises in the sky, and gradually the, the air heats up and gradually the puddle is getting smaller and smaller. He's still frantically hanging on to the notion that everything is going to be all right. Uh, because this world was meant to have him in it and that it was built to have him in it. So the moment at which he disappears kind of catches him a little bit by surprise. He did feel very passionate about wildlife and, and the, the very fact that, you know, humans um, could, in the not too distant future, uh, rid the planet of all wildlife. And I think he felt very strongly about that. And of course, wildlife doesn't have a voice. And he thought, well, I'm in a great position to give wildlife a voice. And that's what he did so well. Unexpectedly, he was offered a chance to give wildlife that voice by the Sunday Times. Many years ago, the phone went and a voice said to me, we'd like you to go to Madagascar. We'd like you to look for an aye, aye which is the rarest form of lima. Plain leaves in a couple of weeks. Uh, could you be on it? Now, um, I, assuming they'd got the wrong number, <laughs> instantly said yes before they could discover their mistake. <laughs> It was on this adventure that the idea for Last Chance to See was born. I said to Mark Carwardine, who was the zoologist who had been sent along on this expedition to make sure I didn't sort of trip over things and fall out of trees and stuff, and to show me around, I said, I'd like to do more of this. I'd like to go and see some more rare animals around the world and see, perhaps, you know, shall we collaborate on a project and do a book? And he said, well, sure, it's what I do for a living anyway. Um, 
So, so we did. We made our plans, and a couple of years later, we set off. He, he had this fantastic ability to educate and entertain in the same breath, and I knew then that we needed uh, someone like him to be a spokesman for our charity, uh, for Save the Run International. We went on an expedition to Africa with a, one of our runner costumes, and we walked from Mombasa to the top of Kilimanjaro. Um, right across the plains of Africa, which was a fairly madcap scheme, but Douglas understood that almost immediately. He understood the need to get out there in amongst the local communities and do something on the ground. Yes, Douglas kept a fire burning under us for the guerrillas. He was always there on the end of the phone. He always kept us enthusiastic, kept us thinking global about what we could achieve for these animals. Being amongst these animals was a two-way street. He found insight in the strangest places. It's funny, you look at any of the higher primates or um, you know, the, the more intelligent animals or whatever, what do they do? They spend a lot of their time playing. Now, playing must be terribly important. Here's how we know it's terribly important, because an animal's basic job is to keep alive and to reproduce itself. So the fact that all these more intelligent animals do so much playing means it must be important somehow or other. Playing must be important. The greatest, greatest uh, creative artists who ever walked this earth, I mean, people like um, Mozart, Bach, Richard Feynman, Louis Armstrong, Shakespeare, they're at their best when they're, re when they're just doing stuff for the sheer delight of it. Douglas's time among the higher primates revealed to him a hidden value in saving and studying endangered species. The moment you see other animals trapped in their own behavior, it's interesting just to reflect back on us and see whether we aren't also trapped in our own behavior. Uh, we do, of course, have this uh, wonderful capacity over and above animals, that of self-consciousness and the ability to uh, uh, look at what we're doing and understand it, and also to learn from each other's mistakes. So we are unique in having the ability to uh, learn from each other's mistakes, but also remarkable for our apparent disinclination to do so. OK, important point being made there. We learn from our mistakes, or stubbornly, we don't. Which brings us neatly to something we've been promising you for quite a while. How did somebody who hated writing as much as Douglas did actually write all those books? I think Douglas himself often felt that he'd fell into being a novelist really by accident. It's not what he'd intended. But once the first book was successful, what are you going to do? You're going to write another one and then another one. One of the rules of being a writer is that it is a solitary activity. You know, any time you're away from the keyboard, you're kind of cheating. And OK, you can say you're doing research, you can say you're researching people, you can say you're having downtime, you're relaxing, but you've got to sit behind a keyboard or a sheet of paper at some point and do it. And Douglas hated that. That he was astonishingly good at it didn't make it any easier for him. When I first read Hitchhiker, before I knew Douglas, I felt that he, this man, Douglas Adams, was communicating directly to me one-to-one, -one, that he understood my mind, and I understood his mind. And it was like a kind of complete connection. And it was a wonderfully kind of safe feeling to have with this author. And what I've discovered is that everyone who likes Douglas has that feeling. And one of Douglas's great gifts is his ability to connect intimately with his readers. That is the most important thing you have to figure out. Anything you want to communicate, how is this message actually going to be received? What is the experience of, of, of the reader? Now, if you're a writer, you've got to learn to do that. It isn't a question of compromising what you've got to say. It's a question of putting it in such a way, so clearly, so simply and straightforwardly, that the, 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 the reader gets it. They got it. They got it by the millions but the success of the books was a two-edged sword. I think when you produce such a perfect object first time round, and then you get the commercial machinery saying, hey, that's great, we've all made millions, now let's do it again and again and again and again. When you're building on terrific success, it becomes progressively more and more difficult. Everybody is lacking self-confidence, and we all have insecurity problems and uh, dealing with issues of self-esteem. Um, it manifests itself particularly uh, highly in artists 
and those in the creative realm for what reasons I'm not sure. Well, I think anybody who knows uh, or knew Douglas uh, well was was obviously aware of of the insecurities of his nature. Uh, it was a, a consuming part of his uh, his makeup. I think he was somebody who uh, wanted every word to count. Um, but I, I also think that the more successful he got, the more difficult it became because, you know, if you've been paid $2 million to write a book, you're thinking, well, each word is worth <laughs> so many dollars. Is, I've written it. Is that really worth <laughs> $50? Yes, it, oh, it is. Oh, that's worth $75. Uh, <laughs> I think that would be very sort of inhibiting to, to write under those circumstances. Well, he wasn't a typical anything, Douglas. I mean, certainly... Um, he wasn't a typical writer. I mean, most writers write. Douglas was a writer who, you know, pretty hard to get him to write, to start with. Douglas had been doing his thing at the Miami Book Fair that year. I would place this conversation something like 90, 91, and um, he was going to embark on the book that he never finished, Salmon of Doubt. I was there, Douglas was there, Sue Freestone, his then English editor, was there, and Peter Gazzardi, his then American editor, was there. And we were all talking to him about the book, and he suddenly exploded, which he very rarely did. And he said, now look, don't treat me like a baby. Stop treating me like a child. I told you I was going to do the book in a year, and I'm going to do it in a year. That was 12 years ago. Ah, Douglas and deadlines. Now, how did that go? Well, Douglas was famous, really famous, for not not um, meeting deadlines. It was famous statement was, I love deadlines. You just love the sound. The whooshing sound. The whooshing noise they made. They whiz past you, yes. And that was certainly true. And this is where his editors stepped in, and each had his or her own creative solution to the problem. The thing about Douglas was you had to keep coming up with different ways of sneaking up on him uh, and to get him to kind of get him to write. But once, I mean, once he trusted me, and part of the fun of it was the ways in which I did that, but also one of the great joys with Douglas was that he did invite you, he invited me into his imagination, and I became like a traveler in his imagination and with him in this journey into what we quite often had no idea, but we were going. The very first book he ever wrote that I represented, um, he was going to miss the deadline, and he asked me to call his British publisher, Sonny Mehta, um, who now runs Knopf and the one's running Pan, to tell him that he just wasn't going to deliver the book. And Sonny said, that's impossible. And I said, well, that, you know, he's not going to do it. And he said, I've lined up book signings, appearances, all that, and, and he has to do it. Um, so I'm going to take a suite at the Barclay Hotel, and Douglas is going to move in there, and he, I won't let him go till he finishes. So I said, well, OK. So I called Douglas, and I told him what was going on. And Douglas moved into this vast suite at the Barclay, which I saw was amazing. You know, and here was this man. He would do anything rather than be in his hotel room and write. He'd go and talk to the chefs in the kitchen. He'd talk to the waiters. He'd talk to the reception staff. He'd be in the bar chatting up every single guest. And two weeks later, he emerged with Sonny, a little bleary, with the manuscript. And many years later, I said to Douglas, how did that work, Douglas? And he said, oh, it was very simple. He said, I sat at the desk and typed and Sonny sat in an armchair by the desk and glowered. Well, the last two weeks of writing Long Dark Tito and the Soul were like no other two weeks in my life, for sure, where uh, Douglas was up against a deadline which absolutely could not be moved, this one. It was a tour with Pan of Australia, which had already been moved once at huge cost and inconvenience, so we had totally promised Pan that he would be on that plane on that Friday night. Uh, but he still had quite a lot of the book to write. So for the last two weeks, we had, well, the last 10 days, really, we had about three hours sleep in those days altogether. And we lived on black coffee and iced donuts, as you I guess. And we were completely, I mean, I think we'd sort of left, left this planet, really. For all the insecurity, struggle, and anguish. Melvin Bragg wanted to make a South Bank show program about Douglas Adams to coincide with the publication. Now, of course, the book wasn't ready. So instead, Melvin made a film about writer's block. Getting stuck. I said, are you getting stuck? I just thought, 
talking about hell about. So, Trillian says, oh, write this down. Trillian says, are you sure you didn't dream the whole thing? He produced an extraordinary body of work. I'm sure that most people on Earth wish that they had written um, seven novels, two nonfiction books, and all of the stuff he did. I mean, there's a huge achievement that Douglas had, um, as well as a lot of things he didn't achieve. Chief among those, seeing his book turned into a film. The issue of the film was the single most substantial frustration in my professional life, and certainly Douglas's. The first deal I made for him was with a, a guy who wanted to make a television series of it. And he wanted to take the BBC series and then make it into an American series with ABC. And that fell apart. And then we sold it to um, Ivan Reitman, who was in a Columbia. And Douglas, like so many Brits uh, before him and, and after him, uh, went out to California. They sprayed his name on a parking space. He was very feeling very happy. And, you know, I go around the rest of the world, and I know there are millions of people out there who want this movie. And Hollywood looks at it and says, I don't get it. <laughs> I, uh, Ivan Reichman uh, asked me into the office after nine months of working on the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide film and said, uh, look, we love this thing. We love the setup. We love, you know, the, the meaning of life and the meaning of it. But, you know, in 42, it just, it's a letdown to the audience. It just isn't funny enough. You know, can you come up with some, a funnier number? <laughs> I, I think it was at that moment that Douglas sort of started to get disenchanted with Hollywood. Incidentally, there are a number of theories out there concerning the origin of the use of the number 42. There's the he lived there theory. He lived at uh, 42 Arlington Road in Islington, I think. I think that's where it was. Where he was living with Johnny Brock. No, I, don't, I, I, think don't that, I think that's where the number 42 came from. There's the please theory, which Douglas put forth in an interview with Ian Johnston of the Sydney Morning Herald, where he related, I remember working as a prop borrower on a video arts training film and John Cleese was playing a negligent bank teller, adding up a column of numbers who pays no attention to a customer who goes off to a good bank teller. And as he passes John again on the way out, John comes up with the figure he'd been adding up. There had been a lot of discussion at lunchtime as to what that should be, and I seem to remember the most ordinary number was thought to be 42. And last, but not least... 42 is a completely meaningless number with absolutely no significance of any kind and then, and then it developed this huge significance for people and it's now passed into the language and people know that the meaning of life the universe and everything is 42. Anyway we were talking about the various films that didn't happen. I then met at a dinner party uh, Michael Nesmith and we started to talk about Douglas and Michael said that he was one of the great Douglas fans and I said, well, maybe you should be interested in producing Hitchhiker, because Michael had produced some pretty interesting pictures along the way. And so Douglas and Michael met, fell in love, as people did when they met Douglas, um, swore eternal loyalty. We made a, a joint venture deal with Michael. And then Douglas wrote another screenplay, this time with Michael helping him. And uh, eventually that fell apart, too. And then the latest deal was with Disney, and that came about because for the better part of 20 years, I've been going around Hollywood saying, I've got this fabulous science fiction comedy where men and aliens meet and have fun. And they say, get lost. And then they make Men in Black, and they say, where can we get a science fiction comedy where men and aliens? And Douglas went out to Hollywood again, went to Santa Barbara on Hollywood. By the time we had met, commercially, we had probably peaked. You hope artistically you haven't. Uh, but inevitably, those kind of people, us, find ourselves in Hollywood going, can we re reinvent ourselves here? Can we, can we uh, take the same messages we had 20 years ago and turn them into a film and, and reach an even broader audience? We suddenly find, once again, the same old problem with Hollywood, which is that it is not a typical Hollywood picture, and they really, really want typical Hollywood pictures. Well, it stands in an interesting place now because they've just hired another writer, um, who is the guy who wrote Chicken Run, and Jay, uh, has been really um, very loyal to this project. We all 
Everyone associated with Douglas somehow wants this to happen more than ever because we want to do it for Douglas. We want to do it for his memory. We want there to be an opening night. We all want to be there um, for Douglas. It's like dedicated to him. On May the 11th, 2001, Douglas Adams was working out in the gym. Douglas had gone in um, early in the morning for his usual session. He had gone on to the treadmill for uh, about 20 minutes. According to, to Peter, the trainer was very much under control. He had a heart rate of about 130. And uh, he, we then typically, after the, uh, the aerobic uh, workout, went on to gym work. And the first was, um, uh, for Douglas that day, was, uh, was stomach crunches, which required that he lie down on a bench. And at that exact moment, Peter had turned and had picked up a towel. And as he turned, he held the towel at Douglas. Um, and it was at that time that Douglas basically uh, rolled off the bench and, and, uh, and had his, his attack. Douglas's death came as a shock to his fans, to his friends, and to his loved ones. I've got two sons who work for the BBC. One of them rang up. I could still get emotional about this, sorry. And said, we've just heard that Douglas Adams has died. I couldn't believe it. It, it, it was such a shock. It was almost like losing one of the family. I hadn't realized until then, really, how much he meant. No, I still don't. <laughs> It was followed by a tremendous outpouring of love and appreciation. Douglas collected friends because Douglas cared for people, and Douglas's concentration on people was very total. I mean, he, he would just, when Douglas focused on you, it was like the lights going on on a, on a theater stage. Fab. No, it was really fab. And I suppose because he was so big, and his hugs were amazing. So you'd, you'd, you'd You'd see him and he'd just sweep you up in this huge bear hug, which actually used to be really noisy. And as I grew up, one of the things he used to do was pretend to be sick on my head, <laughs> which I used to love. It was just very easy to be loved by him. I mean, if you were loved by Douglas, you really knew about it. I shall, I don't know, I, I don't think there's a little part of me that will never give up hope of suddenly getting just a little email at some point. I think that he had this ability to make me feel special, and I miss that. I just miss him. Once I was flying from London Heathrow to Hong Kong, and as I checked into Hong Kong, into the hotel room, I plugged in my computer and checked my email, and there was, no surprise, an email from Douglas. And the title was, How Was C3A? I was like, well, how did Douglas know I was flying on C3A? And uh, I'd been upgraded from business class to first class, and later on in my life, I realized that all of those upgrades were somehow through Douglas Adams. So if someone from British Airways is listening to this tape, if they could make sure that C3A is dedicated to Douglas Adams, that would be great. Well, it sounds odd, really, but he didn't really have any aggressive side to him, in a way. He was much more excited about the world. Whenever uh, you were going to meet up with Doug, you'd know you'd have a lot of interesting things to talk about, and they were going to get excited about things. Douglas was not somebody who tried to manipulate people around him, as far as I, I was aware, like other people I could name, <laughs> um, other tall people I could name. Um, he was a very gentle man, and, uh, and somebody I, he was just somebody I loved. Uh, my son Tom, who's five years old, came to me in my office one day, and he said, uh, he said, Dad, he said, you know, I really miss Douglas. I said, but tell me, what do you miss about Douglas most? He said, Dad, he said, Douglas did the best farts. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's great, because that's, uh, I, Douglas would be tickle pink that, uh, that he would be remembered for his farts. <laughs> the last time I saw Douglas uh, was November of 2000. And once again, he was in town to give a, a lecture at MIT. And um, he had a lecture dinner. And he said, why don't you come along to that? In the middle of dinner, he said, wait a second. And he reached into his bag, and he dragged out a laptop. He said, you know, you have to see this. And he started this quick time movie of Polly um, dancing to, uh, it was basically a, a rock video that he had made of Polly dancing. I want to be a rock star, oh, for sure. I want to be a rock star. Ooh. And it was 
was just really neat to see him, you know, kind of so full of pride and love, because that was a side of Douglas that I had previously not seen. I think I missed his uniqueness on, in the universe. I'm terribly frustrated that I've come to admire much of what he said and did more now than I did when he was alive. Douglas was, in my view, a genius. I've always maintained that genius has come in two flavors. They're either show-offs or sharers, and I've known both. And Douglas was a sharer par excellence. I feel it's, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like being in a room that's had a fire, and you turn the fire off, but you can tell that some, something's been there by the warmth that's left in the room. And that's what I miss about Douglas. He just had enormous warmth. How best to remember Douglas is to be passionate. You know, whatever you're passionate about, put your heart and soul into it. And to be alive, you know, to, to wake up and to take notice and to be alive. The world is, is a thing of, of utter, inordinate complexity and richness and strangeness um, that is absolutely awesome. And I feel that, uh, you know, the opportunity to spend um, 70 or 80 years of your life uh, in such a universe is time well spent, as far as I'm concerned. Heaven from hell, blue skies from pain. Can you tell a green field from a cold steel rail? A smile from a veil.
Take